Order members, we move on to questions to the Minister of Education and we start with listed questions. Questions number six and seven have been withdrawn and I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question one. The Education and Library Board are responsible for determining eligibility, informing that those pupils attending Newton Abbey Community High School who are currently in receipt of transport assistance will have their eligibility protected for the transitional period between moving to Monkstown site and the establishment of the new school on its site. Once the new school is established and opens, all pupils in receipt of protected transport assistance will have their eligibility reassessed to the new school. This may mean that some pupils will lose uh, the eligibility uh, they hold prior to the establishment of the new school. Pupils who attend Newton Abbey Community High School and who are currently eligible for assistance will be reassessed against the Monkstown site following their move. This may result in some of those pupils uh, losing their transport as well. These transitional arrangements only apply while pupils remain enrolled in the amalgamated, amalgamating schools where they, leave, uh, where they leave and apply to other schools. The normal transport arrangements will then apply. I call Paul Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, or thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, would the Minister agree that every effort must be taken to ease this transition for these pupils um, going to Newton Abbey or going to Monkstown School, given that these pupils do live in an area of high deprivation in North Belfast? And does he agree that there is at least a moral argument that pupils should not um, have to meet the three mile cr criteria? <laughs> Well, uh, the boards are showing some flexibility uh, in my original response to the member, and I accept that um, amalgamating schools can be a difficult process both for teachers, pupils, parents, and families, etc. But we have to have a transport policy in place which is fair to everyone. I, as the member may be aware we have recently undertook a review of the transport policy. We will be publishing a consultation. Uh, later on in the year in regards to that matter, but I, I believe that the, the Board has shown flexibility in this matter. I call Pat Sheehan. I got a last uh, can, can the Minister indicate when he is likely to bring forward recommendations on the basis of the recent uh, transport review? Uh, thank the Member for his question. At this stage, it will likely be after uh, the summer recess. Uh, there is quite a detailed document has been published by the review team. There is quite a significant number of recommendations contained within it. I will be consulting with uh, statutory bodies and other departments who are affected by the review before going out to full consultation. Moving on, I call Paul Free. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Education Authority will have a duty to manage its available budget as set in the Education Act 2014 in accordance with the priorities I have identified as Minister with Responsibility for Education. The 15-16 capital budget for minor works is severely constrained, and priority will be given to inescapable statutory requirements such as health and safety and obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act, as well as contractually committed works. I call Paul Free. I thank the Minister for his answer uh, so far. Uh, in many cases, these uh, needs are around health and safety of both the uh, the pupil and, of course, ordinary pedestrians nearby the school. And in many cases, it may be more cost effective and efficient and immediate uh, to put in place a patrol crossing. Would the Minister uh, agree with me that in some cases, in most cases, where schools are denied a crossing patrol, that common sense, flexibility and discretion should be used? Well, I, I would hope that common sense is uh, the guide for most decisions taken out there in the education world. Um, but each, each school will be assessed on its own needs in relation to these matters. The boards, and as we move towards the Education Authority, the Education Authority will assess each school and require whether a school patrol, patrol person is the best way forward or an upgrade of car parking facilities within the school ground is the most financially effective and the most health and safety uh, way forward. But uh, each case will tell its own story, so it's very difficult to stand here at, at the dispatch box and decide whether one case or another has more merits. There are procedures in place. They have to be fully applied, and I would hope common sense prevails. I call Rosie McCorley. Can I ask the Minister if he can provide an update on the establishment of ESA? 
uh, going by legislation of honour and case. Uh, ESA will be established on the 1st of April. All appointments have now been made to the Education Authority for all the nominating bodies. Uh, we have appointed an interim chief executive. They will move into functioning mode from that 1st of April. There is a lot of work uh, for the new authority to be getting on with, both in terms of amalgamating from five education boards, the staff commission, into one efficient, effective delivery mechanism. And it also has to be said that the Education Authority is also facing quite a difficult budget uh, in the months and indeed years ahead. I call Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Given that the original question and answer has, has focused in on uh, road safety and safety, uh, would the Minister give consideration to 20 mile an hour um, speed limits around all schools? It is not within my power or within my gift. That is a question for uh, the Minister for Regional Development. Moving on, I call Sam Gardner. Deputy Speaker, question number three. Uh, at this stage, it is estimated that 500 teaching and 1,000 non teaching posts will be re made redundant during the coming financial year. It is too early to determine the number of redundancies which occur in the Southern Education and Library Board area. Uh, it is for individual employers to determine their staffing requirements, and it is not possible at this stage to determine the actual numbers of posts that will be declared redundant. I call Sam Gardner for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister thus far. But could I ask the Minister what criteria will he establish across the whole of Northern Ireland to make teaching staff redundant, and will he guarantee that these will be evenly applied across all schools and sectors? Um, well, the, the driving criteria at this stage is the financial situation we find ourselves in. Uh, so schools have to ensure that they balance their budget. So therefore, schools will establish as to whether they, what complement of staff they require to deliver the curriculum within their schools. All schools are affected uh, across all sectors, um, and each sector will uh, have to, and each individual school will have to make decisions around its staffing level. In terms of non-teaching staff, that will obviously also be affected by schools' decisions, but also by decisions taken by the Education Authority uh, in the months ahead. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And given the, the difficult budget situation that many schools find themselves in, has the Minister given any consideration to using the school surplus fund um, available to his department in a more creative way in order to offset the needs of schools? Well, the member raises a very interesting point, and it's worth noting, despite a very difficult financial term last year, in the 14-15 financial year, there's still a £47 million school surplus out there. Now, I'm not suggesting that the majority of those schools uh, should now go out and spend that surplus, but there's quite significant surpluses, and indeed, in some cases, they run up to over half a million pounds, accumulated over several years. Now, that money is given to schools to spend on the educational well-being of the pupils now. Uh, and I've said it before, some schools say to me, I'm saving it for a rainy day, and I say, well, I'll tell you what, it's raining. And that money now needs to be drawn down in, in a responsible way and used. But I do think there is a question here for perhaps a debate in the Assembly, or indeed, and without stepping on the toes of the Education Committee, perhaps further research by the Education Committee, as to how that surplus, if not drawn down within a reasonable period of time, is reinvested in education. Because I do not think we can continue with a scenario which allows £47 million of unspent monies in education. I call Alex Maskey. Uh, go on, I got last one. Cool. Can I ask the Minister what uh, efforts the Department is, uh, is taking to try to protect frontline services? Um, we have invested uh, a significant amount of money since the draft budget in our aggregated schools budget, which is an additional £80 million uh, to frontline school services. Schools are still safe, facing significant pressures moving ahead, though. As I said in response to the previous questioner, there is a £47 million school surplus pot there, which needs to be drawn down. Uh, a significant amount of it needs to be drawn down in this year. Or I believe that the Assembly and indeed the Executive may want to look at that in a different light than they have in previous years. I have done everything within my power to uh, achieve efficiencies both within my department and across the education sector. The Education Authority in itself will ensure that there are savings within education though, over a number of years. 
uh, and we are attempting to look everywhere to see if there's additional monies that can be provided to education, both in terms of European funding. We have seen the recent intervention during the Stormont House talks in relation to funding for shared education and integrated education, uh, and I'm seeking other avenues of funding. But it is a very, very difficult financial year. And when you listen to comments following the Westminster budget, and you hear both the Conservatives and Labour saying they're going to continue to cut frontline services for the next three years, then it's a very worrying and difficult time for public services. And I think we have to look at how we deliver public services in a different way in the years ahead. I call Sean Rogers. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Minister, I think we're all concerned about the budget situation, but we know that education should be for all. How do you reconcile the increasing need to ensure that our special education needs children are, have availability to the full curriculum, and at the same time, uh, a thousand classroom assistants are going to be losing their jobs? Well, first of all, it's not correct to say a thousand classroom assistants will be losing their jobs. The non-teaching staff that may will be losing their jobs will be across a wide range of support staff within our schools, and that is an estimated figure. Uh, that final figure will be known when schools make their decisions as to what budgets or how many staff they can afford under their current budgets. And schools have to now go through their budgets, including their surplus, including the £47 million surplus that's sitting out there, which now requires to be spent in education. So it's not correct to say, and I think it's alarmist to say, that there's going to be a thousand classroom assistants lose their job. That is not correct. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Uh, I am committed to promoting greater use of school premises to help meet the needs of local communities. Existing legislation and a range of departmental policies, such as Every School a Good School, the Extended Schools and Full Services Programme, already enable and encourage schools to make their premises available for wider community use. In seeking to enhance levels of community provision, my department also published and issued guidance to all schools in January 2014 entitled Community Use of School Premises a guidance toolkit for schools which is designed to assist principals and board of governors in providing for community access to school facilities. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, answer so far. Could I ask the Minister, in terms of the whole community, and indeed given the constraints on his budget, whether he would actively consider marketing, uh, along with the individual schools, the facilities, not just to the local community, but indeed to the third sector and indeed the private sector, as making use of the facilities? Well, I, I think the member makes an interesting proposal. Uh, and as I said in response to Mr. Maskey, we're going to have to look at how we uh, deliver public services in a different way and how we ensure that our, that our public services, particularly our schools, uh, are used to their full extent and that if there are opportunities for them to raise revenue in working with the community or to save even in terms of uh, revenue from another department, whether it be health or social services uh, or whatever it may be, then I think we have to look at doing it in a different way because we are not going to have uh, the monies in the future to deliver the same range of public services in the same range of buildings as we currently have. So certainly we should be looking at our schools as state to ensure that it is used to its full uh, maximum ability. And I am more than happy to explore further, is there a way the Department of Education can assist schools in marketing their premises to the community and to the other sectors? I call Mickey Brady. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Could I ask the Minister to detail what powers he has to, inter he has to intervene in cases where school facilities are not openly accessible to the public? Thank you, Madam, for his question. I have very limited, of any, powers in, the, in this area. Schools' day-to-day -day running is down to the Board of Governors. Uh, we have done everything within our power to assist Boards of Governors in encouraging them to open up their school facilities to wider use by the community. Um, at one stage, it was suggested that perhaps we need legislation. I would like this um, uh, toolkit that we have sent out to schools to be in place for at least another year before we consider bringing in legislation to impose it schools to take measures, but we have, currently have around 81 per cent of schools opening up their doors to the community in one way or another. We now want to encourage the rest to do likewise. To me, it is a no-brainer. Schools should be open to the entire community. They should be a community facility, which is good for the schools, is good for education and good for the community. So, To me, it is a no-brainer. 
All the, all the information schools require is now with them. If they require further information and support, my department is open to engaging with any school around those matters. So at this stage, we want to encourage, but at some stage in the future, particularly if the economic climate continues to go the way it goes, schools may find that legislation has to be brought in to ensure that they're open for other community usage. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the response from the Minister. And particularly, 80 per cent of schools are existingly opening their estate to, to the community. One of the greatest worries coming from Board of Governors and principals is the ongoing insurance burdens and pressures on schools. Is there anything the Department can do to ease those, those pressures to enable them to open them more so than they are now? Well, when the toolkit we have issued to uh, the guidance toolkit we have issued to schools um, gives case studies of how other boards of governors, in, in real practical terms, have overcome these hurdles. So, when I say 80% of schools are currently opening up to the community, they have also faced issues around insurance, around public liability, etc., etc. All those things have been overcome elsewhere. So, there's no reason why they cannot be overcome in the remaining 20% of schools moving forward. So, the toolkit provides information to schools around all these issues and encourage schools to use it. I call Alex Atwood. While modern languages are not a statutory part of the curriculum at primary level here, it is a matter for primary schools to decide whether they wish to teach an additional language. In order to protect frontline services and in particular the aggregated schools budget, it has been decided that the earmark funding for the primary modern languages programme which had been running from 2007, will cease with effect on 31 March 2015. My department recognises that teaching modern languages in primary schools has many benefits. I regard building capacity among class teachers as the most sustainable approach to primary language provision. I would encourage primary principals who would like a language to be delivered in their schools to apply for Erasmus Plus funding to build the capacity of their teachers to teach an additional language. I call Alex Atwood. I can thank the Minister for that uh, answer, but in advance of uh, the decision that you have made in respect of uh, funding to foreign languages in our primary schools, was there any assessment made about how that could work itself through in impediments to our people competing in the global market or impediments to our people developing job skills and job opportunities in the longer term, never mind how that might or might not impact upon the creation of a modern, inclusive and open society? Well, over the seven years the programme has been running, um, we have actually seen a slight slippage in the number of uh, young people taking GCSE in modern languages and A-levels in modern languages. So to use your analogy, it would be suggesting that the programme actually wasn't delivering uh, for the economy, that it wasn't promoting uh, young people to continue to take languages. But I haven't used that analogy. I think and I encourage schools to promote modern languages teaching. The question is how do we fund it? Now, our schools have a budget. They have a restricted budget, but they have a budget. So there's an opportunity for schools to continue this programme because we're talking about, in some instances, a couple of hours a week. Tutors were in schools, in some instances, for a couple of hours a week. In other schools, it was more expansive, that, depending on the size of the school. So schools perhaps want to look at can we continue this programme from our own budget? And I accept there's a challenge there. There's also an opportunity for schools to seek European funding around these matters. And we will provide further information to schools around European funding opportunities. And we will attempt to also source other opportunities for funding for schools to move forward. This funding, which was provided by the Department, was additional to the school budget. It was there to support schools to deliver the primary languages programme, but there's nothing to stop schools continuing it moving forward. One of the objectives also of the programme was to upskill teachers to assist them to deliver modern languages in the classroom. And in some instances that has been successful, but in other instances it has not been as successful as we would like. So as I've said throughout the question time today, we're going to have to look differently at the how we deliver public services. We are facing a very, very difficult financial year in schools. Now, I can navel gaze for the next year and say how terrible things are, and they are, or I can lift my head up and start looking for alternatives. And what we all need to start doing is looking for alternatives as to how we deliver public services. And this is a, a particular case where I believe that if we use our imagination, 
we use our know-how, that we will be able to secure funding from a variety of sources to allow this practice to continue as goods. I call Danny Kinnan. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and will the Minister recognise that the, the heavy workload on teachers makes it uh, extremely difficult for them to have the time to learn and to teach foreign languages, and that if he is looking for a way of doing things differently, he should maybe drop the sacred cows like the Irish Language School in Dungiven? For the moment, park it. We still want Irish language in the future, but why doesn't he put that money into languages that helps children learn so that they can get jobs worldwide? So let, let me get this right. You're suggesting I shouldn't drop a primary modern languages program, but I should close down Irish language schools. Right, okay. Irish language is a modern language. So it, 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 Irish language is a modern language, and it is therefore part of the overall delivery of language provision. So I don't think it would make sense for me to close down Irish medium schools to provide funding for tutors some of whom only work several hours a week in schools uh, to provide uh, modern languages to schools. And when we look at the evidence coming from that in terms of our GCSE and A levels in terms of languages, it isn't conclusive that it has actually in ensured that young people continue to take languages moving forward. So if we're going to do something, let's do it on an evidence base rather than on a simple knee jerk reaction and say, well, I'll tell you what, we need money to close down the Irish language sector because we don't like them. No, but it comes across that way. And not, but you have to understand. Order. When you, uh, continue, Minister. Sorry, uh, only one person should be speaking at a time, Minister. Yeah. And, and, and Mr. Kinnan, I suspect, didn't mean it that way. But when you say something, you also have to understand that other people are listening to it and may take it up in an alternative way. And that applies to us all. It applies to us all. So what I'm saying to you is there is an opportunity for this program to continue in a different way, either funded directly by schools, funded directly through European money or other funding we will continue to try and source out. But this may become my mantra for the next year. We're going to have to do things differently because regardless of who goes into Downing Street next time round, they've all committed to cutting public funding. And if we want to con continue to deliver public services, which we all do, then we're going to have to do things differently. I call Nelson McCausland. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the American car manufacturer Henry Ford said you could have any colour of car you want as long as it's black. Uh, when the Minister's Department abandons a programme that offered three languages, Spanish, Polish and Irish, and then at the same time another part of his department seeks to initiate a new programme to bring Irish into schools, is it not a case of you can have any language you want as long as it's Irish? Well, the, the member will also be aware that I'm looking at a new model as well, Ulster Scots model, in terms of introducing uh, and enhancing Ulster Scots provision within our primary schools. The member has met with me recently along with a number of colleagues. We have discussed how we can do that. I hope to call together uh, a seminar in the near future, bringing together schools which have already delivered Ulster Scots language and culture in their schools to see how we advance that across the board. I'm committed to the member to do that. So it's not only... Uh, one model I'm providing here. I'm providing at least two models, and schools can continue to provide as many models as they so wish. I call Trevor Lum. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister must be aware, right across the education spectrum here and abroad, that it, it's widely acknowledged that a second language is beneficial to a child's education. Whether that second language is a modern language or Irish, we could argue about that. Does, does he think that he has given this subject? sufficient priority when he's assessing what has to be cut and what has to be continued? Okay. Um, the member makes a valid point. There is a number of schemes which have lost funding in this budget round, which in normal circumstances I would never have went near. Never. But our budget has been cut year on year since 2010. The education budget has been cut since 2010, year on year on year. We have seen a reduced budget in the executive since 2010, 1.5 billion. You simply cannot continue to deliver the same services with less money as you did last year, the year before that, a year before that. I think I said in the, in the education committee when we discussed the budget that we're now in among the sacred cows, and that's where we are among the sacred cows. Many of the, the areas which have received cuts are being stopped, in my opinion, are sacred cows. But I don't have the money to continue them. That's a simple. So we have to look at doing it in a different way. 
And perhaps what we need to really look at then is this. In terms of the entry qualifications for teacher training, should our newly qualified teachers be proficient in a modern language? Is that the way forward? Is that the long-term thinking in terms of ensuring that we encourage modern languages within, within our schools? That might be a long-term solution, but we need a short-term solution. Moving on, I call George Robinson. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Sorry, question, yeah? Yeah. Uh, with the constrained capital budget position, I currently have no plans for further capital announcement at this stage. In June 2012, as part of 18 projects, I announced Ross Moore Special School in Imavadi. It is anticipated this project will be on site in 2015. In January 2013, the combined the Stress, Craig Back and Mullaboy Primary School was identified as one of 22 projects to be taken forward in planning. The development proposal for this amalgamation was approved in August 2014, and work is currently underway in the feasibility study. When, completing, uh, when, complete a support, when complete a supporting business case will be provided prior to the appointment of a multidisciplinary design team to take forward the detailed design of the new school. In June 2014, they announced 16 capital projects that included Roe Valley Integrated Primary School. A draft feasibility study has been received for this project, and work is ongoing on the business case. Uh, currently, I cannot offer definitive timescales for the commencement of the construction works for those projects due to, due to constrained capital budget position. In July 2014, I announced the first of three major projects under the Shared Education Campus Programme, one being in Limavadi. This project will provide two new shared facilities, a shared sixth form in St Mary's High School site and a shared science, technology, engineering and maths centre on the Limavadi High School site. Work is underway on the feasibility study business cases for this project. And finally, there is one school enhancement project in his constituency. This is for Korean uh, Academical Institution to upgrade the mechanical and electrical services at an approved cost of £1.7 million with the site work commencing on April 2015. So I think the member can agree you're doing OK. I call George Robinson for a supplementary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm actually looking for more. <laughs> I'm asking for Mil Milburn School, and that, that's been on the list for quite a long time in Korean. And I'm asking, uh, is there any plans to upgrade or replace the, the old Milburn School? Um, as I said at the start of my announcement or my answer, I'm not in a position at this stage to make any further announcements in relation to capital budget. I have to assess where our capital budget, which is much reduced, uh, is at, how much we can deliver in this financial year, and in terms of projecting forward what schemes are likely to move ahead in time. So when that work is complete, I will make a decision as to whether I will make any further capital announcements in this mandate. And if I do, I will take it into consideration the members' comments. Moving on, I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, a bespoke training programme has been delivered to board members in advance of the 1st of April. A one-day training seminar was provided by the Department on the 19th of March, which focused on governance and accountability roles and responsibility of board members managing key relationships, financial and risk management, and ethical standards, as well as code of conduct. A follow-up training seminar was also provided by the Department on the 23rd of March, which focused specifically on education issues, including the key educational priorities of the 15-16 budget and the EA's role and relationship with DE. General induction training is also being provided to members on issues such as the EA's organisation and structures, arrangements, format for board meetings and HR issues. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. With this training, uh, would the Minister uh, talk about is there any aspect of it which uh, involves uh, financial responsibilities? Thank the member for his question. Yes, uh, we have covered financial issues and that will be obviously a very important uh, piece of training for the board members, both in terms of ensuring that financial processes are followed properly and in dealing with what is quite a difficult budget for the Education Authority moving forward. It is going to be one of the major challenges uh, for the Authority in, the, in their first year, um, along with many, many others, but they do face difficult financial times ahead, so training has and will continue to be provided. And that ends the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Trevor Clark. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister and I understand the difficulties he has in terms of his finances, but uh, what assurances he can give us that the schools, estates, and in particular our classrooms, are up to a fit and proper standard and the maintenance regime will be uh, stepped up? Well, I, I can't assure the member that the maintenance scheme will be stepped up because our maintenance budget faces quite a, a significant cut this year. Over previous years, we have spent tens of millions of pounds on maintenance, both directly from the Department of Education and monies provided from OFMD, FM as part of their economic strategy. Uh, but I can assure the member that uh, we, what we have to do is ensure that where there is health and safety issues, is that they are dealt with quickly and robustly. I call Trevor Clark. I uh, appreciate that answer. And, I, mean, I know the Minister did accept an invitation by Cree Avery Primary School and did visit that school last year. However, I am sure he was horrified as I and the other representatives of the area that the actually classroom ceiling fell. Uh, fortunately, no children were injured, but the school have highlighted the substandard nature of those classrooms. And what can you, Minister, do to make sure the board makes sure there is appropriate action taken not only bring that classroom up to a good standard, but the rest of the school facilities? I am aware of, of the circumstances, and I did visit the school uh, on the invitation of the member. Uh, I understand from the, from the board, or it will be the education authority at that stage, that there will be a permanent structure or permanent replacement to the, the mobile in place by the 20th of April. That work will commence and continue over the Easter holidays, and that work will, uh, will uh, continue to ensure that, that mobile is replaced by the 20th of April. Other schemes around the school are, are awaiting planning permission, as far as I am aware, planning permission has been sought for other elements that require improvement around the school and in a very limited minor budget programme and in a limited maintenance budget programme I will ensure that the board, the board and the authority focus in on the needs of that school. I call Pat Sheen. Uh, can I ask the Minister to give us an update on uh, progress in regard to anti-bullying legislation? Um, Consultation for the legislation has now closed. There's almost 4,000 responses to the consultation, and I'm pleased to say many, many of them are from young people uh, who are, are often the victim uh, of bullying within our schools, and they have responded to the consultation which has gone out. I'm now analysing the consultation responses. Uh, I will share them then with the Education Committee and set out my way forward. I call Pat Sheen for supplementary. I wonder, whatever measures the Minister introduces, will it include training uh, for education staff? Yes, well, uh, we will set out uh, the way forward in, in the weeks ahead in terms of how we see legislation being shaped, but I also believe that it will require training for education staff and indeed boards of governors in relation to how the new legislation will affect them and how they can best deal and prevent uh, bullying in their schools. I call Jerry Kelly. Good morning, last one, Colia. Thank you, uh, Deputy Minister. Um, or Deputy Speaker, I beg your pardon. Um, will the Minister join me in congratulating uh, Ulidia College on its 20th year as an eco school? Uh, I will, yes. It's quite an achievement for the college, I believe. But among the first schools to achieve the accolade. Uh, I think they are now on to their second flag, so well done to all involved. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer up to now. And, and I know he has been talking a lot today about, and everyone has, about resources and that there, but uh, since this has been such a success, can he outline what guidance is available to other schools who might want to follow the same route and become uh, eco schools? Well, I, I understand that previously the boards and the Future Education Authority will distribute information to schools around this. They work in, in conjunctions uh, with their local councils uh, as to how they, they achieve uh, eco school status. Uh, and uh, quite a number of our schools uh, have been very successful with this. Um, I think there's over 200 schools who have achieved that status. So, well done to each and every one of those schools, and that work will continue through the Education Authority in conjunction with our local councils. I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the inquiry tabled by the Employment and Learning Committee into careers education, information, advice and guidance contained a number of recommendations specific to the Department of Education. Uh, how has the Department approached the, or dealt with the report recommendations? Um, so thank you, Member. We co-joined with the, the Minister for Dell in relation to the overall review of careers education and advice in our schools, uh, which reported um, 
I'm not sure if it was earlier this year or just before Christmas, and those recommendations are currently being worked through uh, with my department officials and in discussions with uh, Dell officials as well. I call David Hildes for supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. On recommendation three, the uh, careers to become a, a compulsory subject on the curriculum, what, what view does the Minister take on that? Well, Instead of me uh, picking out each recommendation and giving a response to it, I think what we should do is, in conjunction with the review carried out by the Dell Minister, uh, then respond to the collective recommendations across the board here. There are a number of elements uh, which are called for as compulsory elements of the curriculum, um, which I don't think can be viewed in isolation and will require an overall review of the curriculum uh, in, in the years ahead to decide which parts of the curriculum you should believe to be comp compulsory. Though it is worth saying that our careers advice in recent inspection reports has seen a, a significant improvement on previous years, and we want to keep that trend of improvement going. I call David McNary. Will the minister indicate how many, or approximately how many, primary age children are studying computer programming? Um, my department wouldn't keep information uh, of that level. Uh, computer programming is not a compulsory element of the primary school curriculum, though, though I am aware that many schools are involved in computer coding clubs and also a number of schools are involved with IT companies in their vicinity who are providing training, I have to say, commendably to the primary school children. I call David McNary for supplementary. I do thank the Minister for his answer and I'm sure he takes the point in, in my question. In a recent uh, AQ, the Minister said that 14,480 Year 12 uh, pupils sat GCSE uh, in Design and Technology, which is a pointer. So I'm asking him, would he be prepared to introduce an early introduction to programming? And uh, I take it from his previous answer, he's unable to give me an example of that, how such a program could be expanded. But I do see the need. Well, there's numerous examples. Uh, I, I've given you a number of examples as to how uh, schools are working with local industry and involving themselves in local computer coding clubs uh, as well. But as I said in, in response to Mr. Hildridge, I don't believe that you can pick one element out, either of the economy or education, and say that's going to be the next compulsory element of the curriculum. I believe that to do that, you require an overall review of the curriculum and decide on the weaknesses and strengths of making a subject compulsory at any level. I am aware that perhaps, for instance, in England, where they have made coding compulsory in schools, they have not provided any funding to back it up. Now, I could turn around and say, well, coding is compulsory in all schools. I have no funding to back it up. So I think uh, in terms of how schools and a number of schools are approaching this matter uh, are innovative and, and inventive, and we should continue to encourage them down that road uh, for, the, well, for the time being until if and when a review of the curriculum is taking place. I call Brenda Hill. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm not sure if the Minister heard from more Central Primary School choir in the Great Hall this, this afternoon, but you will be aware of their active campaign for a 28-based classroom. And given this, what do you believe should be the optimal class size at Key Stage 2, bearing in mind multiple ability and reduced support staff? Well, I, I did hear the school singing, and I thought they were in celebrating their new school. I have many schools in with me who quite rightly uh, complain that they're not getting a new build and that they desperately need a new bill. And we heard examples of, of, of school roofs falling in on pupils. So my, my mind at this stage is concentrated on, on providing uh, suitable accommodation to those schools who haven't got an announcement for a new build, or the maintenance backlog is such that we have roofs falling in on children. So I think there's much to sing about in, Sant in Dromore Central. In terms of the optimum school uh, or classroom numbers, uh, the most important element in any classroom is the teacher and the ability and skills and leadership of the teacher. That's the most important element in any classroom. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his question. Actually, you walked right into my supplementary, so I thank you for that, Minister. And it is there, you have said about it is the quality of teaching that matters most and not the class size. So given what you've just said, what should the PTR be in a key stage two class, given that mod uh, modern classrooms have a smaller square footage? Well, I I'm not going to walk into the trap of deciding how many pupils in each class there should be in Dromore Central. Dromore Central have made decisions in relation to the number of classes they are prepared to run. I personally think that their model is not financially viable going into the future, but that's a decision for the Board of Governors of Dromore Central. I have provided a new build to that school, and I think they have done very, very well of that. 
I am, have bought land for the build a new post-primary school in Drummore, and I am dealing with classrooms falling down on children's heads, or roofs falling down on children's heads. That is where my priority is at this time. It is not to provide more classes to a school that has a suitable uh, new build coming. Uh, David McElveen is not in his place. Alistair Ross is not in his place. And Ross Hussey is not in his place. And that is the end of topical questions for today.